Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. The Israel-Hamas war is now being fought in hospitals. They've run out of supplies and are surrounded by Israeli tanks. As international pressure grows, Israel has released a video showing Hamas infrastructure under a children's hospital. Weapons, telltale signs of hostages being held and military apparatus. Critics say it's all propaganda, although it's a fact that Hamas uses civilians as human shields. They've embedded themselves in civilian areas. Tonight, we'll bring you the pictures. Also tell you about the source of their funds. Turns out, cryptocurrency is fueling the Hamas network. Meanwhile, India has called out Canada's hypocrisy on Khalistani terror at the United Nations. Rishi Sunak has been hit by the first no-confidence letter a day after his dramatic cabinet reshuffle. China and Pakistan are holding their biggest ever joint naval drill. In Myanmar, the ruling junta is losing ground to rebels. Their troops are crossing over to India. In Madagascar, the stage is set for a tense presidential election. In Iceland, they've seen 900 earthquakes in a day. And it's World Diabetes Day. It's a silent killer and we must talk about it tonight. All this and more coming up, the headlines first. Finland mulls closing its border with Russia. Helsinki accuses Moscow of turning a blind eye to illegal migrants. Finland claims Russia is trying to destabilize it. In April, Moscow had warned of countermeasures over Finland's decision to join NATO. Foxconn founder Terry Go qualifies to run for Taiwan's presidential election. The billionaire has promised to ensure that Taiwan does not become the next Ukraine. Elections will be, will be held in January next year. Opinion polls show Go is the least favoured candidate. The Mali army says it has entered the rebel stronghold of Kidal. It's a symbolic success for the ruling junta which seized power in 2020. For years, Kidal has been controlled by separatist groups posing a threat to the junta. Iran asks school children and civil servants in smog hit Tehran to stay at home. The Iranian capital is among the world's most polluted cities. Around 9 million people live in Tehran. Nearly 40,000 deaths a year in the country are attributed to air pollution. Denmark will restrict alcohol sales to minors. Drinks with more than 6% alcohol will be banned to those between 16 to 18 years. Over 20% of young Danes are weekly drinkers by the age of 15. Denmark will also increase taxes on nicotine products. And trouble for Coca-Cola in Germany, its antitrust body opens a probe against the US beverages giant. The case is over discounts for retailers, which could give the company an unfair advantage. In recent years, many American firms have come under the scanner in Germany, including Alphabet, Meta, Amazon and Apple. We are here next to a house of a terrorist. His house is right next to a school. Next to his house, there is a tunnel. The tunnel is let down more than 20 meters down. This is Rantisi Hospital, and this is the place where I showed you the tunnel. Hamas used this hospital. Let's enter into the hospital. And I'm showing you the first evidence to see. I want to show you a room where we found the operational gear of Hamas. These are explosives. We have hand grenades, Kalachnikov, and then we have the RPGs. The motorcycle. They were all used in the massacre of the 7th of October. You're now entering into the room where we suspect the hostages were being held. There is a list. This list says the operation against Israel. This is a guardian list. And every terrier has his own chief guarding the people that were here. The world has to understand who is Israel fighting against. What you just saw is a bombshell of a video. It's been released by Israel. The idea is to show how Hamas used a hospital, a children's hospital in Gaza, to stock weapons and hide hostages. The video, as you saw, features an Israeli soldier. He's giving the world a tour of a tunnel allegedly built by Hamas. Israel says this tunnel is connected to a hospital. Israeli forces raided it. They say they found guns and ammunition, hand grenades, as well as RPGs or rocket-propelled grenades. Israel also says hostages were being held here. Take a look at this. A woman, clothes, and a rope. 
a rope next to the legs. And look above this, look above it. It's a baby bottle. It's a baby bottle in a basement. Above a World Health Organization sign. This is a suspicion for an area where hostages were being held. The war is taking an ugly turn. It is being fought inside hospitals. The charge against Hamas is this. They use hospitals, schools, even amusement parks to build military installations. Their tunnels run under civilian infrastructure, so Israel is bombing them in a bid to demolish Hamas. The attacks on hospitals have led to a lot of outrage. The images of patients dying due to power cuts have shocked the world. So Israel has started releasing videos to show what it's up against, to prove that Hamas is using innocent civilians as human shields. This latest video has triggered a lot of reactions. Israel says it was shot in a tunnel under the Rantisi Children's Hospital. Critics say it's an unverified claim. The video itself does not show where the tunnel opens up, or how it leads up to the hospital. Israel says this tunnel is near a school and near the house of a senior Hamas official. Watch this. I'm here in Gaza City. We are here next to a house of a terrorist. This is one of the senior terrorists who is the head of the operational naval operations that led the raids into Israel. His house is right next to a, to a school. His house is 200 yards from the hospital, the hospital of Rantisi. Next to his house, there is a tunnel. In the next part of the video, it's like a guided tour. The soldier says the tunnel is connected to the hospital. He shows military gear inside, guns, explosives, explosive vests, laptops. There's a bike as well, apparently used during the October 7th attacks. The soldier points to some marks on the bike. He says, these are bullet marks. And in the final part of the video, he takes us to a different section of the tunnel. He says hostages were held here. ...into the room where we suspect the hostages were being held. I want you to look at this room. People are putting curtains with nothing above, just wall. No reason to put here a curtain, unless you want to film hostages and deliver movies. So is this video a smoking gun or a piece of propaganda? The answer depends on who you ask. It's been doing the rounds on social media, evoking strong responses. Supporters of Israel see this as justification for the hospital attacks. Critics say it is full of glaring mistakes. Like this page on the wall. The soldier said it's a duty chart of Hamas terrorists. But critics say it's just a calendar. Although it does not take away from the fact that Hamas facilities are embedded in civilian areas. And at this point, it's really impossible to independently verify each and every claim. But what's clear is this. Hospitals in Gaza have become battlegrounds and patients are cannon fodder. Yesterday, we told you about the Al-Shifa Hospital, Gaza's largest hospital. It remains shut. There is no electricity. Israel says they, they offered fuel for the generators, but Hamas refused. Now, Israeli forces have surrounded the hospital. There are tanks and armored vehicles outside and snipers in the vicinity. The hospital staff is appealing for help. They want a safe passage out for patients. The supplies are running out. The death toll is climbing. 39 patients have died so far due to the shortages. This includes six children. Gaza's health ministry says all hospitals in North Gaza are out of service. Yesterday, the United States tried to intervene. They demanded longer pauses in the fighting. President Biden weighed in too. He said Israel should protect the Al-Shifa hospital. And it's my hope and expectation that uh, there will be uh, less intrusive action relative to the hospital. Uh, we're in contact and we're with, uh, with the Israelis. The pressure on Israel is mounting. Their foreign minister says Israel's diplomatic window is shrinking as calls for a ceasefire grow. For Biden, too, things are getting out of hand. The conflict is widening. Yesterday, the U.S. conducted more airstrikes in Syria. They killed eight Iranian proxies. This is America's third attack in less than three weeks. U.S. forces in Syria and Iraq have come under attack. American bases have been targeted. Since early October, the U.S. and allied forces have faced at least 40 attacks, both in Syria and Iraq. So America is responding with precision strikes and sending out a warning to Tehran. These attacks must stop. Uh, and if they don't stop, then 
we won't hesitate to do what's necessary again to, to protect our troops. The conflict is spreading to Lebanon as well. Israel and Hezbollah are trading fire again. Yesterday, there were fresh missile attacks conducted by Israeli forces. They struck South Lebanon. At least two people died. A reporter at the border captured the strikes on camera. ظهر نهار البارحة وحتى ساعة متأخرة من الليل أنتقل بالصورة طبعا هنا نصبح قبالة يبدو بأنه تم التعرض للزملاء المتواجدين في نعم بالفعل شادي في يرون وهم على الهواء مباشرة يعني واضح بأنه تم على ما يبدو. So far, more than 70 Hezbollah fighters, seven Israeli troops, and over 10 civilians have died. The casualties in Gaza are far greater, but the worst may be yet to come. So you saw the tunnels, you saw the weapons, you saw the infrastructure, which I'm sure makes you wonder, where did Hamas get the money to build all of this? And the answer is cryptocurrency. Forget Swiss bank accounts or suitcases full of cash. Today, crypto is funding terrorism across the globe and is powering the terror activities of Hamas. Let me show you the numbers first. These are from 2019 to 2023. Hamas received $41 million, $41 million in crypto funding. This money went to virtual wallets and then to Hamas. Although Hamas was not the only group that used this mode. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad loves crypto too. In the last few years, they have received some $94 million via crypto. Now, these are accounts that were caught, that Israel cracked down on. So the actual numbers could be much higher. Looks like there's no crypto winter for terrorism. But how is virtual money used to fund terror? To answer that, let's start with some basic questions like, what is crypto? It's digital currency created using algorithms. It's not controlled by a bank or a government or a financial institution. Next question, why use crypto? The obvious answer is the ease of payment. You can make crypto payments from just about anywhere in the world. It's as easy as clicking a button and it's not controlled by governments. Just think about it. If you had to donate to Hamas through a bank, Imagine the bureaucracy involved. You would have to create a bank account. Then you would need to find an intermediary. You would have to avoid sanctions, and it won't be easy. But with crypto, you just need some bitcoins or any digital currency and your device. Now, even to get this digital currency, you need money. So the next question is, who is funding this crypto surge? Reports suggest it's Iran. And that should not be a surprise. Iran funds, arms, and supports Hamas in more ways than one. So giving them crypto would be the next logical step. And looks like they did it. In the two years before the attack, Hamas received money from Iran. It's not clear how much, apparently two large sums. But Iran was not the only source of money. There were individual donors too, from across the globe. These transactions are discreet. You can tell that the money has been transferred, but you cannot tell by whom. That's what the technology offers, anonymity. It doesn't reveal the source of the money. So Hamas made an appeal in 2019. It was published by their military wing, the al Qassam Brigades. They are supporters to donate money. They wanted them to send bitcoins. And the world saw this happening, a terrorist group openly seeking donations in cryptocurrency. So why was it not stopped? Because cryptocurrency was outside the purview of governments. It operates outside traditional banking systems. Authorities crack down on known financial channels, your Swiss bank accounts, your offshore links. They come under the scanner. But authorities usually ignore this other ecosystem of cryptocurrency. And that's what groups like Hamas exploit. Technically, it's a designated terrorist group, designated by many. Yet in 2017, Hamas was one of the richest groups in the world, with an annual turnover of more than $1 billion. And crypto is just a new way for them to secure funds. Traditionally, Iran has been pouring money, $100 million every year. Other regional players also offer financial support to Hamas, like Turkey and Qatar. They give money, though not for military activity, but... Once you've given the money, it's hard to check where it's going. Then there are fundraising activities. Hamas does it across the globe. 
fundraising in the Gulf, in Africa, even in Europe. Plus, they get tax money because, remember, Hamas controls the Gaza Strip. It collects taxes from Gazans. Twelve to fifteen million dollars every month. That's what they get in taxes, mostly on goods coming in from Egypt. They're all taxed. And finally, they have investments. That's right. Hamas invests in businesses across West Asia, and it uses profits to fund its activities. So donations, fundraising, taxes, and investments. That's how Hamas is funded. It's a stark contrast from the plight of Gazans. More than a million of them live in poverty. 80% of them are unemployed. And now thousands of them are being killed every day, all while Hamas is minting money. Speaking of terrorism, in Canada, Khalistanis are causing fresh trouble. Take a look at this. Yeah, 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 make it, make it, make it, take them. Yes. Take them. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up, hold up, hold Yeah. Good. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Reports say this happened in Brampton. There was a Diwali celebration. It was disrupted by Khalistanis. They showed up with their flags and hurled stones at the attendees. Clearly, this was a premeditated attack. And the Trudeau government must take blame for it. They've put Canada's Indian community in harm's way. Trudeau's tirade against India has emboldened Khalistanis. It has raised the risk of such attacks. And New Delhi saw it coming. Almost two months ago, India had issued a warning. It asked Indians in Canada to be cautious. But Ottawa seems to have ignored the threat. Now an investigation is underway into these Brampton clashes. But the local police is playing it down. They do not see this as an attack. They're calling it, and I'm quoting, an internal community fight. That's all. But India has taken note, and India has pulled up Canada. That too at the United Nations Human Rights Council. New Delhi chose the appropriate moment for this at the Universal Periodic Review. It's done by the UN. It's a peer review of sorts. They go through the human rights record of each country and members are allowed to speak. So when Canada was being reviewed, India spoke up. It said Canada should prevent misuse of freedom of expression. It should deny space to extremists and it should prevent attacks on places of worship. This is what India said to Canada. And there's plenty of evidence to back India's argument here. You just saw what happened during Diwali. In August, a Hindu temple was targeted in Canada. It was vandalized by Khalistanis. Indian diplomats in Canada have received death threats. In the month of June, there was a parade. It featured a float. It depicted the assassination of Indira Gandhi, the former Indian Prime Minister. All these incidents highlight Canada's deteriorating law and order situation, its disregard for India's concerns, its tolerance for extremists, now, in an ideal situation, these would be compelling reasons for a leader to course correct, to take a firm stance against extremists. But not Justin Trudeau. A few days ago, he lectured India again. We were so disappointed when India violated the Vienna Convention and arbitrarily revoked the diplomatic immunity of over 40 Canadian diplomats in India. But we will unequivocally always stand up for the rule of law because that's who Canada is. That's Justin Trudeau speaking about the rule of law while Khalistanis are attacking Indians in Canada with stones. He's talking about the Vienna Convention. He says India violated it. Now, the Vienna Convention is an international treaty designed to protect diplomats. A few weeks ago, India asked more than 40 Canadian diplomats to leave. India has around 20 diplomats in Canada. Canada had more than 60 in India. India wanted parity, so it asked 40 of them to leave. Is this a violation of the Vienna Convention? Let's look at what the treaty says. I'm quoting from Article 9 here. The receiving state may at any time and without having to explain its decision, notify that the head of the mission or any member of the diplomatic staff of the mission is persona non grata. So any diplomat can be asked to leave at any time.
And that's not all. In its defense, India also quoted another part of this convention. This is Article 11. This is what it says. In the absence of specific agreement as to the size of the mission, the receiving state may require that the size of a mission be kept within limits, considered by it to be reasonable and normal. So the treaty clearly spells out the rules. Justin, Trude Justin Trudeau's allegations do not hold water. And no one is taking them seriously anyway. So instead of criticizing India, Trudeau should focus on this, a new security threat. A terrorist is threatening to blow up an Air India flight. His name is Gurpatwan Singh Pannu. He is a member of Sikhs for Justice. It's a sanctioned terrorist group in India. Pannu issued a statement a few days back. He told Sikhs to not fly Air India on the 19th of November. He said their life will be in danger. Those were the exact words. Life will be in danger. Canada says it is investigating these threats. But given their record, this sounds like a hollow assurance. At this stage, nothing less than an arrest should suffice. Now let's cross the Atlantic and look at the UK. There's chaos there too involving people of Indian origin. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has a target on his back. Yesterday he sacked his Home Secretary, Suela Braverman. And the move has bred discontent in his party, the ruling Conservative Party. They're called the Tories. The first call for Sunak's ouster has arrived, the first no-confidence letter. It was put forth by an MP called Andrea Jenkins. She's a supporter of Suela Braverman, among the 50-odd Tories who fervently support her. And this letter could be the first of many. And if that number hits 53, then Rishi Sunak is in for a fight, for meaning 53 letters of no confidence. That's the magic time. number needed to challenge his prime ministership. But why 53? Because that makes 15% of the ruling party, 15% of the sitting Conservative Party members. Sunak's leadership can be challenged if 15% of his party feels he's not up to the task. So is the Braverman bunch big enough? Can they pull this off? Let's just say it won't be impossible. Rishi Sunak had been on a grace period so far, immune from leadership challenges, but that grace period ended last month after he completed one year in office. Now reports say he's been told to quote unquote, prepare for war. But will it really happen? How likely is it that Rishi Sunak will lose his job? Well, if the recent years are anything to go by, Sunak is probably safe at least during the confidence vote. His predecessors faced these votes too. Former prime ministers of the Conservative Party, Boris Johnson and before him, Theresa May, both faced no confidence votes and both of them survived those votes. In fact, the last time a sitting prime minister lost a confidence motion in the UK was in 1979 and this was a Labour leader. So Rishi Sunak won't fear the actual vote itself. But considering what happened to Theresa May and Boris Johnson, Sunak should not rest easy. Both leaders stepped down within a year of being challenged, even though they won their confidence votes comfortably, which means that a challenge permanently destabilizes a prime minister. It paves the way for their exit. So now Rishi Sunak will be watching his back, keeping a weary eye on the Braverman bunch, and at the same time, trying to win over moderate Tories which explains his surprising move yesterday. Sunak brought a former Tory Prime Minister out of retirement yesterday. That's David Cameron. He's been appointed the UK's new Foreign Secretary. He's not an elected MP. So Cameron was appointed to the UK House of Lords. And even he admits it's all a bit odd. Well, I know it's not usual for a Prime Minister to come back in this way, but I believe in public service. The Prime Minister asked me to do this job, and it's a time where we have some daunting challenges as a country. The UK is definitely facing challenges, but Cameron's return seems to be more about Sunak's challenges than Britain's. You see, David Cameron is seen as a moderate, and the complete opposite of the now-sagged Suella Braverman. Cameron was anti-Brexit. He championed the push to remain in the EU. He actually resigned in 2016 after the UK voted to leave. And other decisions during his tenure are also considered moderate. 
like his support for gay marriage. We mentioned this yesterday. Cameron's return may help Rishi Sunak with public perception, but perhaps not as much as he would like. Well, he can't do any worse than what's currently in position, and maybe he's a mature fig figurehead that we need at the moment. I say I, I understand from why the Conservative Party probably did that and why Rishi Sunak did that, bringing in an established politician with a reputation and some gravitas, but ultimately I think it's a, it's a short-term decision and a short-term option for David Cameron, as I don't necessarily think he or anybody realistically believes they're going to be in power after the next general election. So, yes, yeah, a safe pair of hands for uh, realistically what's going to be a temporary job. The UK is heading for a general election next year. It must be held before January 2025. So one year, give or take a month. Rishi Sunak and his party are trailing in opinion polls by as much as 20 percentage points in some polls. So unless there's a miracle, Sunak will be in the opposition next year. The question is, will he lead that opposition or not? Suela Braverman will likely stake a claim. And there will be others too. So David Cameron's return is a play for the Tories as much as for the public. Rishi Sunak wants his party to support him and he's dangled Cameron in front of the fence-sitters. Will this help him stave off a Braverman challenge? We'll keep you posted on London's Game of Thrones. Meanwhile, closer home, China and Pakistan are holding a naval drill, their biggest ever joint naval exercise. Reports say a Chinese warship has docked at the Karachi port. There are multiple other vessels, including a submarine. They call it the Sea Garden Exercise. And the timing could not have been worse. A major economic crisis is playing out in Pakistan. The country is struggling to make ends meet. But for Pakistan's military, it's business as usual. Recently, China delivered four frigates to Pakistan and now the PLA has sent a large contingent for this drill. So what do they hope to achieve and should India be concerned? Our next report has the answers. Pakistan and China are iron brothers and this brotherhood extends to their military. The PLA and the generals in Rawalpindi have similar goals. Together, China and Pakistan want to contain Indian influence in the region, create a strategic buffer and launch fresh territorial challenges. The Sea Guardian's exercise is a manifestation of those priorities. China and Pakistan hold this exercise every year, but this time they have widened the scope dramatically. This is the largest naval drill yet. For this exercise, China has sent several warships and submarines, included guided missile frigates while the Pakistan Navy has deployed nine vessels in all, along with three choppers, four fighter jets and one maritime patrol aircraft. Together, the navies will hold different kinds of drills. For the first time, they'll conduct a joint maritime patrol, one that New Delhi will be watching closely. These drills are happening at the Karachi port near the western coast of India. China's mouthpieces are amplifying these drills. They spell out two objectives for these drills protecting strategic sea lanes and practicing a joint response to common threats. But the scale of these drills hardly inspire confidence. Anti-submarine operations are part of these drills. Also, the navies will practice a special formation. It's called VBSS, short for Visit, Board, Search and Seizure. These are a set of tactics where soldiers learn how to board ships, search them and take control of the vessel if needed. Pakistan and China are improving their interoperability. Pakistan's navy now has more Chinese weapons. In May this year, they got a new delivery from China, four guided missile frigates. Pakistan also plans to add new Chinese submarines. Beijing and Islamabad are developing the Hangor-class subs together. These run on diesel and they could be deployed near Indian waters. The first deliveries could happen before 2028. Clearly, high seas is the new priority for Pakistan and China. The goal is obvious. Mount a bigger challenge in the waters of the Indo-Pacific. The Sea Guardian exercise comes after a meeting in New Delhi. Top US officials visited India and this was for the 2 plus 2 dialogue between defence and foreign ministers. During the talks, the U.S. reaffirmed its commitment to the Indo-Pacific. 
Uh, we are promoting a free and open, prosperous, secure and resilient Indo-Pacific, including by strengthening our partnership through the Quad with Japan and Australia. Uh, one significant way we're doing that is by enhancing maritime domain awareness, sharing commercial satellite data with countries in the region to boost their capacity. So India and its allies are keeping a watchful eye on the Indo-Pacific. As China and Pakistan expand their activities, the need for constant vigil becomes more important than ever before. Now let's look at another Chinese client state. One more that's gripped in turmoil, Myanmar. For about three weeks now, Myanmar's military junta has been fighting rebels. It started in the eastern state of Shan, and now it has spread across the country, even to Myanmar's border with India. This happened yesterday. Reports say rebels seized a town near India's border, the town of Rikhodar. It's across the border from Mizoram in India. This is the northwest of Myanmar, in the Chin state. The rebels there belong to the Chin National Army. It's one of the many ethnic militias in Myanmar. On Sunday, this group attacked the Myanmar army. The army has a base in the border town. The rebels attacked it. They besieged it overnight, withstood constant airstrikes air by the junta. And by yesterday evening, they captured the town. Needless to say, it's a setback for the ruling junta. They've been losing ground around the nation, ground and soldiers. Some troops are even fleeing to India to escape the rebel uprising. As a result, Myanmar army started uh, taking shelter towards Mizoram. And, nine, and, and 39 of them surrendered to Mizoram police last evening. This morning again, we still capture two Myanmar army. And apart from that, another one is also injured. Uh, that is already admitted in Champai Civil Hospital yesterday evening itself. So the total Myanmar army who got surrendered in the hand of Mizoram police are 42 in number. For India, this is a major cause of concern. The tension is spilling over. The fires of rebellion in Myanmar will not leave India unscathed. And it's not just troops crossing over. India is seeing an influx of refugees too. More than 5,000 people who took refuge to Zokhotar and Bufekjong. These are the two villages along the border. 5,000 refugees have entered India and this is just the beginning. Tens of thousands have become internally displaced in Myanmar. They're trying to flee the fighting on the ground and the junta's retaliatory airstrikes. This is all over the country. Let me show you a map of Myanmar. The rebel offensive began on the 27th of October in the eastern Shan state. Three rebel groups came together to form the Brotherhood Alliance. Now the fire and the fighting has spread to all these other states. The rebels keep releasing videos. They're claiming to have captured key cities from Kale in the north to Kunlung in the east. <laughs> It's also spread to the towns at the border with India and China. So everywhere you look, the rebels seem to be making gains. In fact, they even claim to have shot down a jet, one of the junta's jets. The rebels say they brought it down. This was in the Kaya state. It borders Thailand. Rebels have been on the move there as well, and the junta is scrambling. They've declared a curfew in the west, in the Rakhine state, and in Shan, they've imposed martial law. Remember, this is where the rebellion began. This is also where the rebels have made the most gains. They've taken over several towns and captured over 100 military outposts in Shan. So will martial law help the junta reverse its losses? Or will it inspire more rebels to join the fight? 
It's hard to say at the moment. Myanmar's military took over the country in February 2021. They pulled off a coup. They ousted the democratically elected government, imprisoned top leaders like Aung San Suu Kyi, and proceeded to rule with little opposition. These rebel groups have been around, but they've been quiet for years, biding their time perhaps. Now it seems every group has decided to act at once. It's the biggest challenge to the military's authority since the coup. And given the way this fire is spreading, the junta's problems may get worse in the coming days. Now let's turn from Myanmar to Madagascar. It's an island nation of about 28 million people, located off the east coast of Africa. This is one of the poorest nations in the world, ranking in the bottom five for per capita income. And right now it's gearing up for a heated election, Madagascar's presidential election. It will take place on Thursday. Four former presidents were supposed to compete. Each of them was to fight for a second and last term. But now two have dropped out. They're boycotting the election, asking for it to be postponed. And so are other politicians. The electoral process must comply with international standards. This is not the case at the moment with the election that we are trying to organize on November 16. We are strongly calling for the electoral process to be suspended. They say the country is undergoing an institutional coup, but the current president has rigged the game. They're referring to this man, Andri Rajolina. He's 49 years old. He's already served one term as president and one term as a junta-backed leader. Back in 2009, Madagascar had seen a coup. The military propped up Rajolina. He oversaw the writing of a new constitution and the transition back to democracy in the year 2013. And he did not give up power willingly. He wanted to remain in charge. But he was not allowed to stand as a presidential candidate. So he backed a different candidate, hoping to be made prime minister. But that didn't happen either. So Rajalina stood for the presidency in 2019. He took control again and allegedly began bending Madagascar's institution to his will. That's the charge leveled by his opponents anyway. It's really an election, I mean with one candidate forcing his way into office, so it's just a masquerade. Two former presidents were part of that rally. They have been protesting during the campaign against Rajolina's high-handedness. Opposition rallies have regularly been denied permission or they've been met with tear gas. Rival presidential candidates have also been injured. The United Nations has expressed concern at the crackdown. The EU and the US have denounced Rajalina's use of excessive force, but he has been downplaying all of it. The international community will choose the path of stability. The opposition today wants chaos. They are taking the population to the streets, to insurrection, but they can't do it. And I'm telling you this because the population supports me. Rajalina believes he has public support. His rallies have been drawing in thousands. But the opposition says it's all paid for. And that's not all. They also say Rajalina should not be allowed to contest in the first place. You see, Madagascar used to be a French colony. And now, the president of this former French colony is a French citizen. He became a French citizen in 2014. So did other members of his family. And Madagascar does not allow locals to get dual citizenship. So technically, Rajalina is no longer a citizen of Madagascar. How can he run for president? That's what the opposition is asking. But he has refuted this too. He says his citizenship of Madagascar was not revoked. Even though it happens to everyone else, the president is apparently special in this case. So as you can see, it's a complicated scenario. Madagascar is heading to contested polls amid violence. Opposition leaders are boycotting this election and a Frenchman is set to extend his rule over a former French colony. For our next story, let's talk about Delhi's favorite natural disaster, earthquakes. Every few weeks, the Indian capital experiences tremors and X, formerly known as Twitter, goes crazy. There are alarming posts, sensational headlines, and let's not forget the memes. So imagine what would happen if there were 900 earthquakes in a day. 
It happened in Iceland. 900 small earthquakes shook the southern part of this country. Roads were damaged. People were ev evacuated. But scientists say it's the sign of something big to come, probably volcanic activity. Our next report tells you why Iceland is bracing for a volcanic eruption. It was the early hours of Monday. The town of Grindavik was fast asleep, its residents oblivious to the magma shifting under the Earth's crust. They woke up, however, to a seismic swarm. 900 earthquakes in just 24 hours. The Earth was moving, and it was moving fast in this part of Iceland. Earth can just open up and swallow you, you never know. So it was really scary. And uh, actually, when I came here to safety, I felt so good, so relieved. This is Grindavik, a quaint little town of 4,000 people. It's located in the Reykjans Peninsula, 50 kilometers from the capital, Reykjavik. It's a hot spot for volcanic activity. And the reason for this is the Fagra Dalsvjak volcano. This volcano erupted in 2021. It was the first time in 6,000 years. Since then, it's been rumbling. For those living here, many earthquakes are no big deal. They experience it all the time. But this time, it's different. And the reason for that is a river of magma flowing underground. You see, most earthquakes are caused by movements in the Earth's crust. Basically, tectonic plates shifting. But sometimes it's caused by magma, the hot molten rock that's present underground. On Saturday, scientists discovered a tunnel of magma. It's around 15 kilometers long and it's connected to the volcano and it's flowing beneath the Reykjans Peninsula. The events took a sudden turn on Friday the 10th of November. The magma that had accumulated beneath the ground suddenly began to propagate into a so-called um, intrusion, a, a thin sliver of magma that began to propagate towards the surface. And this intrusion now sits just below the Earth's surface, so a molten sheet of magma over a distance of 15 kilometers, and it in fact stretch, stretches through and beneath the coastal town of Grindavik. So now there are two things that could happen. The magma could just sit in the upper crust. This could be for days. Eventually, it could cool down, solidifying in place. This could take weeks or even months. The other is a volcanic eruption. And that's what scientists are bracing for. This particular intrusion could receive more magma. This could increase the pressure and eventually lead to a volcanic eruption. So which will it be for Iceland? The country has 33 volcanic systems in total, so it's no stranger to volcanic eruptions. That said, will it be big? In 2010, the eruption of the Eya Fjatla Jakutol volcano led to massive disruption, both in Iceland and globally to flights. But scientists say this one will not be as big. However, Iceland is prepared for any eventuality. They've already evacuated citizens, but such evacuations don't happen often, and this has left the citizens of Grindavik anxious and worried about their future and that of their town. Today is Children's Day, but 14th November is also significant for another reason. Before I tell you what it is, let me ask you a question. Do you know what the following have in common? Kamal Hassan, Rekha, Sonam Kapoor, Samantha Ruth Prabhu, Anil Kumble, Basim Akram, and Nick Jonas. They're all living with diabetes, as are 422 million people worldwide. So 14th November is also observed as World Diabetes Day to raise awareness about a disease that has often been dubbed the silent killer. Why the silent killer? Because of its prevalence of remaining undetected. World Diabetes Day was created in 1991. 14th November is also the birthday of Sir Frederick Banting. Banting discovered insulin along with Charles Best in the year 1922. And speaking of insulin, Brace yourself for a quick science lesson, especially for those who did not pay enough attention in school. What is diabetes? It's a chronic disease, often running in families. It happens when your blood glucose, also called blood sugar, is too high. Most of the food we eat is broken down by our body into sugar or glucose. It is then released into our bloodstream. 
when your blood sugar goes up, your pancreas release the hormone insulin. Now this insulin is very important. It lets your blood sugar into your body's cells, which is then used for energy. But when you have diabetes, your body does not make enough insulin. It's called type 1 diabetes. Then there's type 2. That's when your body is unable to use the insulin properly. This is the most common type of diabetes, type 2. And this is what it leads to. Too much sugar stays in your bloodstream. In the long run, it leads to serious health problems, most commonly affecting your kidney, heart, and eyesight. And despite the giant leaps made by medical science, no cure has been found yet. Type 1 diabetes is not preventable, but type 2 is. Through a healthy diet and regular exercise, if you quit smoking, you reduce the risk of diabetes by 40%. It is now a ubiquitous health problem, also called the biggest epidemic of the 21st century. Here's how common it is. One in 10 adults worldwide have diabetes. More than 90% have type 2 diabetes. Close to half are not yet diagnosed. More than two in three people with diabetes already have complications at the time of diagnosis. By 2040, it is estimated that more than half a billion people will have diabetes. So the picture is not pretty, and it's particularly grim here in India. India is called the diabetes capital of the world. This is what a recent study revealed. More than 100 million people in the country are living with diabetes. That's more than 11% of our population. Another 136 million are in the pre-diabetes stage. More than 60% of people with prediabetes usually end up with diabetes within five years. Another major concern is this. A large number of children are affected by it. A study was done in Chennai and Delhi. It has found a link between type 2 diabetes and air pollution. So that increases the risk given how high our pollution levels are. Plus, South Asians in general have greater insulin resistance. This makes us more prone to diabetes than Caucasians. The only good news, if you can call it that, is this. Most people with type 2 diabetes have type 2 diabetes, and that is preventable. Adopting a healthy lifestyle significantly reduces your risks. Keep your body weight in check, quit smoking, eat healthy. These are simple steps. They'll go a long way in battling this silent killer. Living with diabetes is a reality for many of us, but we still have a choice. We can choose what impact this insidious disease has on our lives. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Japan, dogs don kimonos and receive blessings in place of children as the nation stares at a plummeting birth rate. In China, the unused rooftop of a residential complex was turned into a public park and electric air taxis could be transporting passengers from JFK to Manhattan by 2025 as New York tests its first ever electric taxi flight. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1969, Apollo 12 lifted off from Florida. This was the second manned mission to the surface of the moon, but it came chillingly close to disaster. The flight was hit by two lightning strikes right after its launch. We're leaving you on that, on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. どうぞお直りくださいませ。美味しい。はい。玉串を納めいただき。
the acoustic signature such that it can be uh, uh, are now at we, we've been we began certification can fly off immediately again from the platform and Uh, the aircraft today is being piloted by uh, Buddy Denham, our G-Pilot test pilot, who is... Uh, uh